morning. Just got attacked by my mask. Well, it is good to see all of you. You're all social distancing and masked up, and uh, it's been a while, hasn't it? Well, rather than listening to me try and tell a, a joke that's not going to be funny, why don't you guys go ahead and stand up, and we'll kick this right off, go into the Lord and worship this morning. <laughs> Thank you. 
joy of being together. We thank you that over these these last uh, few weeks, we've still been able to worship you no matter what was going on because our worship of you is never hindered, God, because you are God. Uh, but I thank you for this morning that we are uh, gathered back together. I thank you for the sunshine and just um, for everything we're going to get to do this morning. I thank you for our opportunities to praise you. I thank you for the, the challenges we're going to receive and the, the growth that we're going we're gonna to have as, as Christians. And I, I know that that happens every time we, we come to your word and, and honestly ask you to, to teach us, God. And I, and I pray that that will be our attitude this morning. God, we love you. We thank you so much uh, for saving us, for loving us. Um, we thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. All right, go ahead and have a seat. Well, good morning. It's very, very good to see your faces again. Uh, and actually, this is kind of unique because this is also as we're we're starting to re-enter, we're also beginning to be on live uh, online at the same time. And so, people who are at home. Uh, they're still with us, but they're at home uh, at both the 8 o'clock and the 1030 service. And so we're just so blessed to have both opportunities at once. Uh, I can't imagine living in a different time period than what we have been in through all of this. Uh, so we actually have been pretty blessed. Uh, and to be able to have the technology that we have, uh, we're going to do things a little bit differently today, uh, obviously. So I'd like to uh, just share with you guys a little bit of what we're going to be doing. I, I'm going to start with communion because that's what time we're in right now. And so what we're going to do, you may have seen the tables as you came in. There are two trays on every table. One tray has cups that have the bread and one tray has the cup that has the juice. Uh, and we're going to partake out there and we're just going to go kind of one family unit or one seat group unit at a time. There are six tables out there though, so it should go relatively fast. When you see another group come back in, then you can go back out. There's a small trash can at each of the doors, and so if you want to just throw away your cups as you come back in, uh, that would be wonderful. And so we're going to talk about communion, uh, and then afterwards I'm going to give you a little bit of an update of where we are as a church financially, and we'll also talk about um, you know, if, if you want to give, there's a box back there. There is uh, the drop box outside, and we still have online giving. Uh, but I'll give you an update in just a minute. We are so excited we get to be here together in person, see one another's faces. Uh, we've been missing each other, I think. Uh, and to just be able to come together and talk about, again, what it is that we gather for purpose for. We have been talking about what the first Christians were devoted to, to God's Word. To fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and today we're going to be talking about prayer. These are things that we've all been able to continue on in, even as we've uh, been meeting remotely. Uh, but this morning, specifically, as we're in this time, we want to concentrate on the fact that Jesus paid an ultimate ransom for us. He gave his life, he gave his body, he gave his blood, so that we could have salvation. And it cost dearly. And that's what we remember when we take the bread and we take the juice together. We remember what it cost Jesus to put us in our place of freedom. It cost him everything. And so with that, we're going to pray. And I want to encourage you to take some time to reflect. Take some time to move back to the tables and reflect on what Christ has done for each of us. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for yourself. God, we thank you that you were willing to go to a cross and take our place of shame and give us your place of glory. Lord, I pray that we would use it to continue to give your name glory and to proclaim you to others who don't know you. God, right now, we remember. We remember your, your sacrifice, your body, your blood, and we praise you, God, that you've promised to return for all of us who place our faith in you. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you. 
Well, good morning again. Um, welcome to First Christian Church, Tuscola. We are a church that is loving and living like Jesus. That's right. Uh, I think we're getting that mission statement, aren't we? That's a good thing. Um, again, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> that is not a COVID cough. Um, we have the, uh, the offering drop box there in the middle. We also have the Dropbox outside. We also have online giving. I just want to update you guys because sometimes when we're away from each other, we can tend to think the worst. We live in our own echo chamber and we might think, man, is our church just going to not exist through all of this? And that's that's just not the case. God has continued to be faithful. Some of you have seen some of the updates. We're actually further ahead in giving this year during the same span of weeks that we've not been gathering than we were last year at this time. That's amazing. Um, you know, just, yeah, praise God for that. <laughs> last week we were able to share that, uh, or maybe it was two weeks ago, we talked about the whole 540,000. We're actually down to 518,000 um, in the, the total debt. And so we're getting closer and closer. This debt reduction campaign has continued in the midst of all the chaos that is happening in our world. And so that's not the case for every church. And so I'm convinced that we are paying attention to the things that matter. We're preaching God's word. We're saying true things. And that is important. Um, and I believe that God is blessing us for that. And he's doing that through your faithfulness. There are a lot of people that are also still contributing in the ways that they, they, they volunteer uh, and do things around the building. And so we're just so excited to be able to say, guys, we're still the church. We're still being his church, and we're still witnessing him throughout the world uh, in our community, in the circles that we can, the way that we can. So again, welcome again to First Christian Church Tuscola this morning. I have a long sermon for you this morning with small, smile, chuckle. That's really true, actually. Um, this week is a little different, as some of you have already seen, and some of you at home are experiencing, because we're not all yet back together. We may have been wondering as we were on our way, 
who's going to be there, who's going to show up, who's not, and what to expect. Now, some of you might have called each other a little bit and known, oh, yeah, I'll be there, you'll be there, okay, cool, can't wait to see you. Um, but overall, there, there's an idea of, well, what will it be holistically? And so it's nice just to see you all here who have been able to come. Uh, this week, we're in week four of a series that we have entitled Devoted, and the topic is prayer. And so we're going to be talking a lot about prayer today. It seems extra appropriate that we would be on this specific topic, especially considering how the year 2020 has been going so far. We need to spend extra time with Jesus right now, don't we? All of us can acknowledge we need our extra Jesus time. Uh, and that's just real. I saw a, a post not too long ago. Um, it had said, I'm thinking about taking my, my mom's offer of slapping me into next year up. And uh, I think some of us can relate to that. We, we want to be in next year. We want to be beyond the things that we're in right now. And so just kind of making light of some things, but at the same time, there are a lot of things in our world right now that we just can't make light of. Um, again, this week, the topic is prayer. I want to share with you all something that some of our kids actually learned at a CIY event this year. Um, it's an acrostic to help people remember different aspects of prayer. And so the acrostic is tacos, and we all can agree if you can like tacos, you can like prayer, okay? And so it just kind of goes the T-A-C-O-S um, the, the first one actually should say Thanksgiving. We don't have to pray about tacos unless it's what's on the menu for the night. Uh, but the first one is Thanksgiving, okay? So we should be praying and thanking God for what he has done for us consistently. We should begin with the spirit of thankfulness and just say, God, thank you. Thank you for being yourself. Thank you for what's in my life. Thank you. And then we can move into adoration. This is just a fun little way for us to help us remember an easy way to pray. We can adore him for what we love about him, what we're enamored by him with, and what we consider to be great about him. And then we can move into a time of confession because there's plenty that all of us need to be confessing to the Lord. Confessing, Lord, I need help. Confessing, Lord, I've sinned. Confessing, Lord, I... I need to see things your ways. And so confessing things to him is absolutely something we need to have as part of our, our prayer. And the next one is others. Guys, we, we pray uh, a lot about sickness, but we need to pray for others in general. We need to pray for their salvation. We need to pray for who they are as persons and what they're becoming, what Christ is making them into. We need to be praying for others. That's a huge part of why we have a prayer chain. So we know that we uh, are, are consistently praying for others, but sometimes we leave a whole lot out of those prayers for others. Sometimes we're not willing to share what we need prayed, prayed for us individually so that other people know how to pray for others as well. And the last thing, and it's probably appropriate that it's last, because a lot of times we move this last one to first. We always remember to pray for ourselves, okay? But we probably should consider these other things first more often. But we do need to pray for ourselves. We need God's help. We need uh, for him to, to be in our life showing us things. So we do need to pray for ourselves. Tacos is just a fun little reminder to help us know how to pray a little bit better. There's so much we can learn about prayer. You can read through the Psalms and you can learn much about conversing with God and how to truly be honest with him uh, in the good times, in the bad times, in the difficult times, in the ugly times, in the whiny times, in the mournful times, and in the confused types of times. All of these are present. People have showed us how to pray in all of these situations if we care to look. And people have prayed, God, where are you? Don't you listen to me? <laughs> we can resonate with prayers like that. We need to be reminded it's okay to, prayer, to, to, to pray honest prayers and to seek the Lord. Some of us think sometimes that we have to bow our head, close our eyes, fold our hands, because that's exactly what we learned as a child. And it's okay to do that uh, out of reverence, out of tradition. But we can pray in other ways too. We, we can pray while we're walking we can talk to God. We can pray while we're driving and talking to God. And in fact, in that instance, I would encourage you, don't close your eyes and don't fold your hands. You need those 
in driving, okay? And some of you are like, well, I'm a pretty good knee driver. You haven't seen it yet, okay? But there are lots of ways that we can pray. Sarah and I sometimes will go for a walk, and we'll be having a conversation with one another, and in the middle of it, we'll just begin praying to God, too. And so we include him in our conversation that way. I've done the same thing uh, with other friends. Uh, I know that I've r- ridden bicycles with uh, uh, Jason Renner, and we'd be riding, and then we'd be praying. Uh, this happens with other people, too. There are lots of things that we can exercise this muscle of prayer and learn and grow. Some of us reveal, though, through our prayer lives that we pray most consistently when we need slash want something or if somebody's sick. And you guys, the, the reality is we need to pray about everything all the time. We need to be a prayerful church, prayerful individuals. We need to be coming to the Lord consistently, not just when, and fill in the blank. It needs to be consistent. Now, some of us think prayers are like questions in the sense that there's no such thing as a bad question, right? And so we might find ourselves saying, well, there's no such thing as a bad prayer. And I I actually think that's wrong. And it's our next point of the day. The prayer that refuses to consider or yield to the will of God is a bad prayer. That's real. The prayer that refuses to consider or yield to the will of God is a bad prayer. Let's take a look for just a moment at one of Jesus' more famous prayers. We're going to open up our Bibles. I Hope you do have a Bible with you because they're not in the chairs this week. Uh, Or if you have a phone, or you can just follow along with me because most of the time I'm a decent reader. Um, And so I'd like to ask you to open up to Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 through 15. This is a prayer that we're very familiar with, the Lord's Prayer. Again, Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 through 15. This is how it reads. Jesus says, pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now then the Lord continues on, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Let me tell you what I hear from Christians on a fairly regular basis, that if we were to put some of our our attitudes into this prayer structurally, the way that it might actually sound. It's not necessarily a prayer of, Lord, thy will be done. It's a prayer of, Lord, my will be done. And so if you just follow along with me, I think that it could go a little bit like this sometimes. God, I actually think I'm pretty important. I want what I want, and I think that should be okay in your kingdom too. I want my will to be done. The end of the world looks to be around the corner, and I need to know everything there is to know because I'm not ready and I'm not fine with the way things are in my life. In fact, I also am not okay with you allowing some of the things to take place which are taking place. I need my time on earth to be more stable. I need to know so much more than what I'm going to just eat for today. I need to know the whole plan, I need to know the details in order for me to be content with you and most right among other people. I want it to be timely, I want it to be orderly, or I will be disappointed in you, O God. I expect big from you because you're supposed to be God according to my expectation of you. I want forgiveness for myself and justice dished out on others. I want to choose what I want but still want you to deliver me from the consequences of my sins. Give me heaven the way I imagine it with all the people I care about. Then I think I'm good with you, O God. Except for when life gets hard from my place of comfort, then we will have to have another talk so you can appease me. I'll try to forgive because I know I'm supposed to, but I'm not ready to think about forgetting, no way. 
But if you could forget about what I did the other night, oh God, that would be great. This, this can be us sometimes if we're really honest. This can be the type of prayer that we find ourselves in the midst of. Maybe we're not as blunt as that, but when we look at our motives in our prayers, sometimes this actually is the way that we pray. It seems like we know best a lot of the times. And I think that if we acknowledge that, if we think that we actually know best in a position unwilling to yield to God, then maybe we should just say this out loud. I believe I do not need God. Are any of us ready to say those words? Not willing to say that phrase? Then let's venture into the truth of the matter in prayer. Our next point is this. If we believe we need God, then we should be praying like we need God. If we believe we need God, we should be praying like we need him. I don't know that we pray that way all the time, myself included. But again, if we believe we need God, then we should be praying like we need him. If this is the case, then we are ready to begin a conversation about devoting ourselves to prayer. Because we're saying we're committing ourselves to be dependent on God to show us how to live according to his will and his purposes for his kingdom. We're ready then. We're ready to devote ourselves to prayer. If we believe a cause is truly holy, then we might pester the trash out of God in petitioning him, and that's appropriate. His answer of yes or no can at times reveal the truth of what we're pursuing to be holy or not. Take, for instance, Sojourner Truth, the great woman of Christian faith and abolitionist. She prayed this prayer. Oh God, you know I have no money, but you can make the people do for me, and you must make the people do for me. I will never give you peace till you do, God. Petitioning God in a righteous cause is always appropriate. We also need to consider what it might look like if we begin petitioning God in a cause that might not be righteous. Take, for instance, Job. Uh, You might recall from the story of Job that chapters upon chapters upon chapters, all Job does is complain and bellyache towards God. Him and his friends, they have all these conversations, and it, it just over and over, I mean, he petitions God. But then eventually, in Job chapter 38, if you, if, it, did I say Job once instead of Job? Okay, I want to make sure. Uh, In Job chapter 38, verses 1 through 18, we see what happens whenever God gets tired of a petition that has not been founded in in things that, that matter according to the Lord. God, in Job chapter 38, this is what it says, Then the Lord answered to Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now, I love what's about to follow because we get to see some of God's sassiness come out on Job. He's not putting up with this anymore. At some point, he's going to say enough is enough. And he does it here. Dress for action like a man. Time for me to question you. And you make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb when I made clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band and prescribed limits for it and set bars and doors and said, Thus far shall you come and no farther. 
and here shall your proud waves be stayed. Have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place, that it might take hold of the skirts of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it? It is changed like clay under the seal and its features stand out like a garment. From the wicked, their light is held and their uplifted arm is perspective. We need to come to God so that we can be made. We need to come to God so that we can be informed. We need to come to God so that we can be changed, so that we can be restored, and that we can be turned round right as often as possible because we so easily get off track. Is that not true? We need to be praying and asking God. Some of us, though, again, are convinced that we know best about everything and barely talk to God. And if we do, we talk to him sometimes as though we're in charge. God, don't you think this? You should make this happen. I think that if you would just, or do we yield and bend and consider his perspective? I wonder, is it even possible that we could know what is best when we actually check our sources? If we're not in the word of God and we're not praying, how could we possibly know what's best in any circumstance? And yet we jump right in any time a hot topic comes into play. Or is our first reaction to pray, consider, sit back? If we don't consider the Lord's counsel, it's very possible that we begin darkening counsel with words without knowledge. We want to be careful about that. Now, Jesus would likely call us stiff-necked and hard-hearted if we are not bending our will to his will. We see that throughout Scripture. He's not always sweet, tender, lovey-dovey Jesus. That's real. He's confrontational with a righteous and holy anger at times. Full of love, have no doubt. But confrontational, radical. Let me share with you three big parts of my prayers with God. These are consistently in my prayers. God, I need your help. You've probably heard me pray help in a prayer before. Because I pray this prayer often. God, I need your help. Help me see and understand what I am missing. That is a prayer of humility. It lets us be in a learner's position instead of a knower's position. Help me be focused on doing your will first and only. That's hard. But we need to be willing. First and only. Only, especially when the other Christians around us disagree. That's hard. It's hard to be singularly focused on what we feel the Lord has called us into. It's also possible that he's directed each of us in a little bit different way to direct us all towards his own purpose. That gets tricky, but it's real. Now, I've been a part of prayers where the believers already knew that they were right, so the prayer did not come close to humbling themselves or for asking for God's will. Instead, it more in line was like, God, we're going to do this. It'd be great if you blessed it. We pray prayers like that. Prayers like that sound similar to this. Please help Brother Matthew to see my perspective. Help him know what I know. Or maybe this. Please, Lord. Please help Sister Lucille to stop all the gossip I heard about when I got together with the Bridge Club and they told me all about it. Help her not be such a sinner and more like me. Now, playing with those words a little bit, but sometimes our prayers, the attitude is there. Maybe we're not as blunt as that, but the attitude is there. We lack humility before God so easily. Me too. Real humility positions us on our knees before God as beggars. 
expressing our need for him completely. Our next point is this. When we let God have an active voice in our lives, who we dream of being changes. Again, when we let God have an active voice in our lives, who we dream of being changes. What we started out planning won't always be, so long as we continue to let him have a voice and a say. Have you found yourself asking God in prayer or trying to direct God in prayer? There's a distinction there. Do you just already know what's best without needing to pray and can't wait to tell people about all this divine wisdom that you have individually without God? Our next point is this. Again, this question, are you darkening counsel without knowledge? Because that's what we're doing. When we begin just spewing things out and we've not prayed, God, help me. Help me see what I'm not seeing. Help me understand what I don't understand. Lord, help me do your will first and only. This is what we end up doing. Darkening counsel without knowledge. Do we just know that we're right about most things and get defensive when something comes into conflict with what we've decided is the will of God according to ourselves instead of according to him? These are relevant questions we have to consider. Our next point is this. We're turning the page just a little bit. It's okay to have a preference in a situation if you are willing to ultimately yield that preference to God's will in prayer and in action. Guys, all of us have biases. And so it's fair to acknowledge some of those before the Lord. In fact, Jesus himself, when he's praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, he has a preference. He's saying, Lord, if there is any other way, please, let's do that. I would prefer it not have to be this way. But if there is no other way to save humanity, and this is the only way to accomplish your will and purpose, then, O oh Lord, God, Father, your will be done. Jesus shows us it's okay to have a preference in a prayer and still be willing to yield and bend to God's will ultimately. It's beautiful. We can do the same thing where we say, your will be done at the end of it and come to a conclusion, I will drink the cup all the way down to the dregs. Your will be done done. Jesus was willing to do the will of the Father no matter what. And for us, that's a big deal. This is our next point. Loving and living like Jesus means doing the will of the Father no matter what. I can tell you the rest of the sermon is a will of the Father no matter what. Guys, our hearts have been heavy recently. There's a lot going on in our world. I have ached over the rest of this sermon. I have cried over this sermon. I have prayed. And there are things that we need to consider. I've been learning and relearning these past couple weeks. We are supposed to suffer with. We are supposed to give voice to the voiceless, bring justice for the oppressed, care after the most vulnerable, while taking the message of Christ crucified, buried, resurrected, ascended, and returning. And that message is meant to go to the ends of the earth without excuse, without delay. Let me ask all of us, in the same ways that I've been asking myself, through coronavirus and now Black Lives Matter, is that what we've been focused on and praying? Or has it been more of the I know best according to me and the me, me, me show? Let's be real about that. I'm excited that we're here together. I'm excited to see your faces. I'm excited to be able to smile and see you, see my face and share and grow and I guess we can't say rub shoulders but rub air together I guess I love all of you
I also have to be honest that the quickest way to wear preachers out is by not being the Christians that we're supposed to be according to God's word. We can weaponize the word of God to serve our own purposes. We can weaponize the word of God to serve our own agendas. We can bend our life to Jesus and be willing to give up everything so all might know him at all cost. What's it going to be? You want to keep your life the way it is? Keep it and lose it. That's scriptural. If you're willing to lose your life for Christ, you will find it. I am finding my life more and more in Christ lately. My boldness and bluntness is also growing, which gets uncomfortable at times. Uh, And I'm already probably one of the more mouthy people you know. (laughs) Um, We have to say things about things that are wrong. We need to be praying right now. And prayers not only... For some of the things that we've been praying, like, Lord, bless me, Lord, keep me, Lord, give me, Lord, comfort me, those are all important prayers, yes, but they can't be our prayers only. We also need to pray that the Christians in our nation wouldn't be such snowflakes, that we would wake up and be who Christ has demanded. The kind of Christian that he paid a ransom for with his blood and body. Now, some of you are like, what's a snowflake? Uh, Let me share that with you from the Urban Dictionary. If you're not quite hip with some some, uh, current terms, snowflake is a 2010's derogatory slang term for a person, implying that they have an inflated sense of uniqueness, an unwarranted sense of entitlement, or are overly emotionally, uh, overly emotional, easily offended, and unable to deal with opposing opinions. So again, coming back to that point, we need to pray that Christians in our nation wouldn't be such snowflakes. Now, some of you might be thinking, preachers shouldn't be saying derogatory slang terms about other Christians. My question would be, what do you think Jesus was doing when he called people snakes and vipers? That's real. He wasn't saying the nicest things to people. We need to be aware that there are righteous confrontations that might sound unholy from a bubble perspective, but are very holy when we look at the overall attitude of Scripture. What do we think that he expressed in his holy anger when he flipped the tables and destroyed the property of the money changers and profiteers in the temple who were profiting off of other people's oppression in place of poverty. Have we reconciled that? Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, our hero, literally caused physical damage to property in the temple to make his point because people were profaning his purpose and there was no other way to get people to listen. And guess what? Jesus was a man without sin. That's a different take on it, isn't it? White Christians, are we ready to reconcile this or not? I have. I believe Jesus was blameless, and I also believe that there comes a point of holy rage where holiness prevails in an uprising to get people to listen to injustice and a time to rage against the machine. I believe that it's true. Fundamentally, I want you to know I'm not promoting writing. I do not agree with writing, but I understand it. We have to acknowledge there is a way to understand it. And if we cannot even understand it, then it really is because we choose not to look at what is uncomfortable in the world. It's past time for us to wake up and to call things out on the carpet that are 
inappropriate in our circles. Some of us are mad and scared this week. I'm mad and scared this week too. I'm mad we continue to not listen to a perspective other than our own as white Christians when black individuals make a unified effort to be heard and seen, no matter what it looks like. I'm scared for us who think we are always on the right side of things, that we might never completely wake up as we justify not lending our voice to things that matter. I'm not going to point the finger in this next part, but instead I'm going to confess. I am ashamed... myself. That at the age of 39, as a white Christian man who has black friends, that Friday was the first time I've ever stood on a corner with a person of color to let them know that I also believe their life matters. I'm not saying that's the only thing you can do to make a point but I'm ashamed of the inaction I have had in my life. I confess that to you. I am ashamed as a preacher that I have not been as crystal clear about who I stand with and how I will stand out for Jesus while showing people of color who might be curious if I love them or not that I do love them. Some of us grew up not hearing I love you a ton from people that we needed to hear it from. And it hurt, didn't it? I know I didn't hear it from some people I needed to hear it from in my life. How dare we not express our love to those who need to hear it right now. As white Christians in the church you may find yourself thinking, well, that's just not us. How many people of color do we know in our town or circles? Maybe not many. There's not tons. So when we see something on such a large scale, which could impact them largely, how important do you think it is that we show up with them? That we call them? That we speak the words, I love you, and your life matters? instead of making it a different issue. We talk about the issues, but do we talk about those issues with the people they affect the most? Or do we just talk about them? Guys, I let cops know that I appreciate them. I do. I let veterans know that I appreciate them. And I stand, and I attend services. So when I have a black friend who needs me to stand up and let them know that they matter and I see them and value them, why have I not done it before? What did we do this week beyond liking, sharing, posting, and opinionating? What are we going to do? I want to continue to help us understand and grow because I'm learning a lot right now myself. People say that the church grows a lot as the preacher grows, so I hope that we're all going to grow a lot together. All of us here believe that every soul matters, don't we? We do that. Every soul does matter. And some of us are like, preacher, see... That is why I I want people to say all lives matter. That point right there. That's why I want to hear people say it. And the, the answer to that is no. Not in this moment. Not in this moment of time. That is our incessant need to control the narrative. Some of us are overbearing know it alls. They always have to have one more word to tweak it 
just the way that we have to so that we will be semantically satisfied with a statement. And even then, we still won't be satisfied because it's still not said exactly the way that we want to hear it said. It's inappropriate of us. Our need to have it our way, our need to have it right according to us, is our need to control, and we don't understand that. So again, do you believe every soul matters? Yes. If so, why do any of us feel a need to correct the statement, Black Lives Matter? There's no need. If every soul matters, then black lives do matter. Our black friends need to hear us say it. And not about the organization or platforms. Our black friends need to hear us say, your life matters, black lives matter. Or are we too proud? We're looking for the reasons to not say a simple phrase that our black friends are screaming and pleading for us to just utter out of our mouth. It's such a small request, really. If my wife Sarah were to die, and we gathered here for her service or at Hillegoss Funeral Home, and I stood up and started to give a eulogy, and I started beginning talking about how her life matters, mattered in that instance, which one of us would stand up and say, less? All wives' lives matter. I can tell you, in that instance, I would look at you like you're a jack wagon and tell you to sit down because that moment is about my wife. This moment in history is about black lives. And we need to acknowledge it or else we will lose our voice for another generation with black people. And it is not okay. When our black friends stand with a sign that says Black Lives Matter, they need to hear from us at least once and oftentimes more. Yes, you do matter. I see you. I hear you. I love you. I stand with you. Jesus loves you. They don't need to hear another self-righteous white person correct their wrongness yet again. I wonder, have any of us had someone in our life that we just couldn't do right by? A professor, a teacher, a parent who we never could live up to their expectation? Have we ever known that disappointment that no matter how hard you work, how hard you try, no matter what you do, you can't quite satisfy them? If we've had that, we should be able to get this. And maybe you don't feel individually responsible. Maybe some of us are better at this than some others. But the truth is, as a collective group, we have not done well. And we have to acknowledge that. We need to stop correcting people when they're hurting so badly and so publicly as a people group. It is doesn't help us and it doesn't help us witness Jesus it doesn't help us take salvation to the black community we want to be helpful don't we don't we for those of us who think well it's really not a big deal our town isn't like that I want to express that you are wrong and as long as it exists in any form or fashion, it is a big deal. And it does exist in our town. Just Tuesday, before I continue on, I, I just want to ask this, actually. How many of us believe this? Like, we, we've used it as a, you know, catchphrase as Christians. Shine light on it so that it can't gain any power. 
Expose whatever is dark, whatever is sinful, whatever is bad, so that Jesus can have his way with it. Do we believe that? That we should expose what is ugly in the world so that Jesus can have his way with it? If we believe that, then you need to anticipate this is hard. It's hard for me to communicate because I know there's potential backlash here. Just Tuesday, one of our own families stood with signs peacefully at a corner communicating, look at me, acknowledge me, my life matters, only to hear some backwards thinking person yell out, eat shit and die on a corner here in Tuscola. Unacceptable. Were there tons of positives that happened that day? Absolutely there were. But there were lots of negatives too. One negative that has been so bad that it still has not been shared yet. So much hurt that can come in a moment of trauma from somebody else's moment of power. That's just one example of many things. Since I'm not holding back, obviously, this morning, when I found this out, it stirred me to action. My honest engagement was I was pissed. Sarah cried. I, I get mad with people. Sarah cries with people. Both are appropriate and holy reactions to injustice in the world. Some will still feel the need to interject some argument. But guys, we've grown up in this. We see a black person, we take a step away. We turn the other way. We say things like, roll up your windows, lock your doors. We're in a bad community at the first sighting of a black person. You know you've been in the car when it happened. It's not right. These are the little small things that continue to enable this type of thought and process. Think Jesus walked around thinking, roll up the window, lock the door? Or do you think he went to people? Four hundred years of systematic oppression dating back to the first slave arriving in America in 1612. Black history goes way back before that. But in America, potentially that's the beginning of the race war that's still not over. Is it lost on us that after 400 years of the Jews being oppressed in Egypt, God finally leveled the superpower of the world and delivered a people? Is that lost on us? How many warnings... How many plagues did it take for them to get it? Let them go. Get your thumb off of their life. Let them go. How ruined did Egypt have to get? And they still didn't get it. We need to hear this because we need to give voice against racism, against oppression, against prejudice as much as possible so that we can actually stop it. Praise God we live in a time period that spotlights people so that they can't get away from the video and hide in their sin while other people suffer needlessly. I would encourage you, do not be silent. God would not want us to be silent. Unless, of course, we plan on adding to the white noise, then we need to shut our mouths. Some may be tempted to say, well, if you protest, then you're kind of asking for it. We do that in our white minds. We think thoughts like that. But really, asking for it? Being a black person, standing on a sign questioning the world, do you love me? Do you see me? Do I matter to you? You're asking for it? Let's put that in a different category. That's almost like saying that a service person during the Vietnam War 
who wore their uniform out into a place that they weren't welcome deserved to be called a baby killer and spit on. Do you believe that? I don't. So being black and showing up and saying I matter, that does not justify an idea you were kind of asking for it. We shouldn't tolerate people. We should embrace them and help them feel welcome if we truly are trying to advance the kingdom of God. We don't get to pick and choose what biblical justice we side with. If something is biblically wrong, it is wrong. If it is biblically right, it is right. If something is a holy cause to join your voice to, then it is a holy cause to join your voice to. If we're called into action, then we are called into action. And right now, white Christian church, we are needed to say positive things to black people in our lives. We have to make an intentional decision to not stand before Jesus with a list of excuses and antidotal memes and posts to justify our lack of willingness to see what is really real in the world, and we have to lend our voice and action to it. Our Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible and of our hearts, the champion of our life, our Savior. And we have already predetermined that we're going to be a biblical church, right? Talked about that just a few weeks ago, being a biblical church. Our Jesus is a brown-eyed, brown-slash-olive-skinned, flesh and blood, radical lover of all humanity and souls. He is a Jewish man, and we do not portray him that way. We should take down every picture of him that's white. That's true, because it's not real. He confronts sin with love and righteous rebukes. He calls out complacency. He rips entitlement. He exposes the religious elite for the frauds they are. He is loved by many, and he is hated by many. But people know where he stands. And everybody has to make a decision about him. He who heals the broken. He who touches the untouchables. He who engages the outcast of society. He who gives voice to the poor and oppressed. Our Jesus is everything God wants us to be. Loving and living like Jesus. If we talk to him more, prayer. If we spend time with him more, prayer prayer. We have a bigger possibility of being who he wants us to be through prayer. I'm going to close with this idea. Jesus' eyes pierce the soul of a man. He sees who we are. Hebrews 10 verse 31, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Closing question, how does Jesus see you? Let's pray together. God, thank you for helping me through a difficult sermon. And this pales in comparison to the difficult life many of our friends have lived, generations upon generations. God, we praise you for progress, but we ask you for help in continuing. Lord, help us to be the Christians you want us to be, not the ones we're comfortable being. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, as we close this morning, can we pray one more time? Um, God, we, we love you, and we bring our, our hearts before you. Um, God, it is not uh, essential or even possible that we all agree on everything, but where your heart is concerned, God, we, 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 we must submit to that. God, help us as a church as we try uh, together to discern what that is in every situation. Help us to, to be united. Um, God, Satan loves it when we don't agree. He loves it when we, when we are turning on each other. Um, 
God, help us to to be united and to be the church um, that is going to make change for your kingdom. Not just regarding one issue or two issues or three issues, but regarding the main issue, which is people need to know Jesus. And I pray that you'll help us to do that. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you guys for coming out. Have a great Sunday.